every Sunday we got around the uh, the dinner table, usually around, you know, one, two, three o'clock, and we ate great food prepared by my aunts and my grandmother, and that was, you know, our tradition, and, and that was my expectation of hospitality, right? A lot of love going in to make the food. Food was plentiful, it was delicious, a lot of buzz around the table, very welcoming. If you weren't part of the family, you were welcome just like you were part of the family. And so that's what we try to do um, at our restaurants. Welcome back to the podcast and thanks for joining me. You know, creating a vibe and an ambiance and an aura is really what brand building is all about. And that's one of the most difficult things in a restaurant, uh, especially if you're first starting out. But if you have an existing restaurant, really think about the guest experience because that only leads to satisfied guests, repeat business, word of mouth, positive online reviews. All those things come from your branding and the power of the guest experience when they walk in the door, the sights, the sounds, the smells really are your image, okay? And that really translates to the guest experience as well as happy staff. So listen to this week's episode. It's really all about that. In addition to all the other challenges of running restaurants today, you're not going to want to miss this episode. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Rockstars, your team are the foundation of your business. And every shift, they're leaving impressions with your guests in your restaurant. Now, every impression counts, and they have to be positive. Training is the key and absolutely essential to providing what I call amazing dining experiences. But effective training takes time and commitment if you had to do it yourself. Well, imagine a staff training tool that's completely customized to your restaurant brand and restaurant. It teaches your entire menu and what makes your restaurant brand special. Then it trains your team, your entire team, to sell because sales are the lifeblood of your business. Now, it's also important to recognize rising talent in your organization. This tool also trains future stars to become leaders that can run your business for you. I call that an exit strategy. Now, this tool is called Serve. Now, learn more at srvnow.com. That's srvnow.com. Check it out. Not answering your phone is one of the quickest ways for your restaurant to lose a potential customer. But between serving in-person customers and dealing with the kitchen, it's hard for staff to prioritize incoming calls. That's why your restaurant needs pop menu answering. Simple questions that keep your phone line tied up can be handled without pulling a staff person from your in-person hospitality. Reclaim the power of your phone. Pop Menu Answering is powered by artificial intelligence to answer the simple questions most people call in with, like, do you have outdoor seating, or what are your hours? Within the Pop Menu platform, you can customize answers for your restaurant and choose the voice your guests hear, plus create customized greetings. Pop Menu Answering picks up your phone 24-7, 365 days a year, turning every phone call into an opportunity. Plus, Pop Menu's full collection of tools helps optimize your restaurant's website and menu, streamlines your ordering experience, and assists in retargeting to enable you to build long-lasting relationships with your guests. Get help answering your restaurant's calls now with Pop Menu Answering. And for a limited time, my listeners can get $100 off their first month plus an unchanging monthly rate at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Go now to get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. With me today, Mr. Bob Anderson. He is the president of the Great Greek Mediterranean Grill. I'm really excited to have him here because I love talking shop with operators. And this is a cultural podcast. This is an operational podcast. We're going to talk all about the ins and outs of running a great restaurant. So welcome to the podcast, Bob. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Roger. And thank you for having me and look forward to, to talking with you this morning. Well, that's fantastic. Before we get into this, you know, we were just talking earlier about Greece and the lifestyle and the culture and and family and tradition and how all those things enter into the cuisine itself. And what you're offering is people, you know, people go out to restaurants for a variety of reasons, but they're sometimes looking to just sort of escape their day to day every way. You know what's going on, the problems, the ups and downs of life, you know, just take a break and go out to a really great place. 
and you're providing that experience. So let's talk first of all uh, about the Mediterranean or the Greek culture, how that impacts the food itself and the lifestyle. I mean, I have my own feelings about it, but why don't you share your feelings about it? Well, I mean, we feel exactly the same way. I mean, we are, you know, as a company and the people on our team are so passionate, you know, about the food we serve, but also the hospitality, you know, that we deliver. I grew up in a in an Italian uh, New York family and uh, very similar to, uh, you know, Greeks. Every Sunday we got around the uh, the dinner table, usually around, you know, one, two, three o'clock. And we ate great food prepared by my aunts and my grandmother. And that was, you know, our tradition. And, and that was my expectation of hospitality, right? A lot of love going in to make the food. Food was plentiful. It was delicious. A lot of buzz around the table. Very welcoming. If you weren't part of the family, you were welcome just like you were part of the family. And so that's what we try to do um, at our restaurants. And we're very, uh, I would say, very successfully delivering an experience of exceptional uh, Mediterranean food um, and also exceptional hospitality uh, above what you see in most uh, fast casual restaurants. It's, uh, you know, we want to be the leading brand of the fine, fast, casual Mediterranean space. And there's an opportunity right now for a company to do that. And we want to do it around the world. And that's what we're, our mission is. And we're on the way doing it. And our customers are responding um, in that way that if, they, if they're familiar with the Greek hospitality and Mediterranean hospitality, or if they're not, they're responding in the same way that they just love uh, the level of food experience, the level of hospitality experience that they're having at our restaurants. You know, I love the word hospitality and that you use it so freely because it is the foundation of our business. And it definitely means, you know, everything that you said it does, but it, it also goes back to treating every customer as if they're an old friend, as if they're not just a first time visitor, that they are a regular or a loyal, you know, customer and that sort of thing, treating everyone special as if they are family, because this is a family, you know, it's a family, um, business that we're in, you know, and, and sharing not just the cuisine, any restaurant can serve food and drink, but delivering a true rare, you know, element of hospitality really sets a restaurant apart. So I can, I get the feeling that that's exactly the experience, you know, at the great Greek Mediterranean grill. Let's talk a little bit about benefits of the Mediterranean diet. It is healthy. Let's talk about some of the menu items and the foods and, and what goes into that and the preparation and just the a lot of these foods go back like thousands of years, you know, it's like, it's, it's the traditional Greek cuisine has a very noble history to it. Right. Here's the, you know, and I love that question because something that we get often is obviously as a franchise group, we're talking to people from all over the world, um, all different uh, countries and backgrounds. And, you know, although it says Greek, in our name, we're finding the Mediterranean um, <clears throat> diet and the Mediterranean recipes are really cross-cultural. While there might be little differences how they prepare it in uh, the Lebanese diet than maybe the Greek or even what you know what uh, you might see in the Italian Mediterranean diet, it all comes back to the same thing. It comes back to simple, fresh ingredients, right? Prepared with a lot of love, right? doing it every day so it's fresh and delicious so you're taking advantage of really that special flavor that you get now the result of that is having healthy ingredients okay or ingredients that are good for you um and they're also taste amazingly delicious so so for us how that's translating into the restaurant is our consumer feels like they can come visit us twice a day three times, four times a week. And that's really helping driving our business. Usually, you know, I've been, Roger, in the burger business, the pizza business, the uh, chicken business, you know, and in those concepts, you see people are on a schedule, right? I, I can only eat a burger once a week, once yes, every two weeks. Absolutely week, true. Pizza is just once a month. So I have this, you know, everyone's on a food schedule. Now, the food schedule in the Mediterranean space and with the Great Greek, it's all broken up because we'll see people come for lunch and get a salad, they come back for dinner and they get a lamb um, entree. Um, and so they're gonna still eat healthy diet, but they're also gonna get great flavor. And of course, they're gonna get exceptional hospitality. And it's like any other brand I've been with, the incidence of repeat customers coming back in is immense. I think that has 
to do with the diet and then the experience they have in the restaurant. And then it's food they can take home and be proud to serve their family, take to their office, proud to serve, um, you know, the, the employees or associates. And the other thing about this space that is just amazing to me, it's very, it's very cross-cultural. It reaches into so many different cultures, this type and style of food, and it's easy. It's not complicated. It's not threatening. So all those things to for us are coming together as like a tsunami and really driving the success of our brand. But at the heart of it is really high quality ingredients that are made fresh daily and served to people with a big smile and a lot of love. And that's where people are really resonating. And we don't discount the smile and the love because this also can be, you know, medicine to the world, right? You know, people come in to eat for certain reasons. Sometimes they're celebrating, sometimes they're down. And we want to be there for both occasions to celebrate or just pick somebody up. Yeah, that's a great point you're making, especially in a, um, you know, an emerging franchise or if someone is a new franchisee, they want to know that the business is going to be there and that, you know, repeat business is very important. It's not just, OK, get them in, get them out. And, you know, there's not an endless supply of customers. You really want to build loyalty with your customers. We're going to talk about your loyalty programs, of course. But let's go back to um, the brand history. Tell us about Great Greek Mediterranean Grill. When did it start? Tell us the story of the company, if you would. Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, the Great Greek is just starting to get on some people's radar right now just because of tremendous success and growth that we're having. Um, but the brand really started in um, May. We just celebrated our 11th birthday uh, in May. It started in Henderson, Nevada. It was uh, a Greek Armenian family, started the original. Um, concept and recipes that we still execute uh, today. It started in a 1,450 square foot location. Um, That store still exists today. It's actually one of our top performing stores. We've added uh, four more restaurants in Las Vegas uh, around it with our partnership, Nick and Trent Jones. Uh, Mm -hmm. Nick and Trent took over that business in 2016. Uh, Trent had a, a very uh, successful uh, background as an entrepreneur and in the real estate, real estate development side. But Nick was uh, was a casino operator, had a lot of uh, vice president experience at the casino level uh, with some of the biggest casinos in the world. So Nick came in and really um, embraced the food um, and didn't change anything with the recipes, but prepared uh, the system of delivering the food so the brand could eventually Uh, expand both at that location, expand the sales, and then uh, expand into other locations. So um, that's what they started in January of 2016. Um, In 2018, they uh, they partnered with United Franchise Group. And United Franchise Group has been around for 35 years plus. We operate in 65 different countries. We have 100, uh, we have, uh, I think, 1,800 Um, units operating and we have different divisions. We have a a, a retail division. We have a consulting division where uh, I think four of those brands are world leaders in their space, whether it's signs, promotions. Uh, And then the food division um, is fairly new at UFG. And, um, you know, that's where Great Greek is. And we have an amazing team that we've assembled um, for this brand to really grow it um, and have tremendous success with the brand. And so kind of that's where we stay today. Last year, we uh, introduced our brand tagline that really, I think, captures the essence of the brand. And that is uh, live your life deliciously. Well, Bob, that's certainly an interesting history of the brand. And it really comes down to foundational systems, of course. We're going to talk a little bit about those systems. But anyone interested in this franchise can be sure that this company obviously has a lot of experience behind it. It's not just a new startup. And one thing that I was really impressed with that I saw on your website, you were ranked the top, you know, by Entrepreneur Magazine in 2022, top new and emerging franchise. So that says a lot about your company and how it operates, professionalism, you know, the systems are dialed and all that. So I'd like to get into that a little bit more. But before we do, let's talk about the vibe and the ambiance of the store. We talked about the lifestyle, the culture of Greece, and you want to give people a, an authentic experience when they walk into a store. So it's about the music, it's about the decor, it's about the feeling, it's about the aromas of the food, it's about, you know, it's about the flavors, and it's about the people. It's all those things. But as if I've never been into a great Greek grill, which I haven't, but I'd like to try it, (laughs) describe to me what I'm going to experience when I walk into a typical great Greek Mediterranean grill. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that our team's going to try to deliver when you walk in is really to engage all the senses, you know, of, of our guests when they come in, whether it's their first time or their thousands time coming to our restaurant. So when you walk into the restaurant immediately, you're going to smell, you know, some of our great proteins, you know, whether it's lamb or oh, yes. uh, chicken or steak that are marinated cooking on our grill or our gyro meat cooking on. So there's going to be a visual of that gyro meat, but you're certainly going to um, have some, some delicious smelling um, food. So that live your life deliciously starts hitting you right in the face. The oh, interior yes. itself is really going to be vibrant and bright. It's going to be, um, I would say, old world modern, right? It's like you're going to see a big white brick wall. You're going to see some, um, you know, wood elements as well. But it's also going to have a, a little bit of a contemporary feel and buzz and lightness to it, which oh. really starts to grab hold of our guests when they first come in. Now, what we're doing today, Roger, is, is what I find really exciting um, is as we build new restaurants, they're all distinctively great Greek. But we have usually a local painter comes in and we started painting, whether it's olive branches, olive trees, little messages um, into our spaces to make them all somewhat unique, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time also be distinctively great Greek. Um, so you're going to get that feel. And then also you're going to get a very welcoming um very welcoming feeling. Our, our team is going to greet you right when you walk in the door. You know, we call it kind of like a re, it's a reunion with our guests. It's like, you know, you haven't seen a friend for for a long time or a family member. And you're like, hey, how are you? Like, that's the kind of feeling that we want to get. So there's a there's a good buzz in the store. Our teams are usually walking around brisk delivering food. We deliver all the food to the tables and the customers don't come up or wait and get called a number. We deliver it out to them. They get their food on a real plate with a real fork, real knife. Um, and then when they're there, if they've ordered a, a, an appetizer or a tzatziki or hummus mm -hmm. uh, or, and they got a dessert, that's going to get staged out to you, Roger, just like you were sitting in a full service restaurant. You know, your appetizers or salad or soup would come first then would come your entree, and then would come your dessert. Our team cleans up after you. We don't even have trash receptacles in our restaurant. So the service experience is gonna be the closest to a full service restaurant for our guests. And at the same time, they're getting this high um, quality ingredient, delicious tasting food. So that's the experience, you know, we put together. And of course, when they leave, we, you know, we feel like we want to give them a hug, but we give them a nice, uh, you know, goodbye. We thank them for their business and we welcome them back, um, you know, for their next meal. And that's, that's, you know, it's in the world of technology creeping in our space. Yes. I like to see the more technology is coming in and the more other operators are looking not to have contact with the guests at the Great Greek, we're looking to enhance um, that experience with the guests by having personal contact. Wow, that's the best of, best of both worlds. You know, you're providing a, an experience, not just food, but it's also quick service experience with the quality, which is rare in the fast casual business. You know, that's Correct. definitely a competitive advantage for sure. You know, I remember being a kid going to a Greek pizza place, you know, and you walked in the door and the music was playing and there was, you mentioned painters coming in. Well, this place, I can remember to this day, they had a muralist, I guess, come in and they painted this whole Greek countryside thing. And you could see the Athenian capital in the background. I think I remember the Parthenon, but you could also see the port and the water and, you know, islands off in the distance. And it really created this vibe and this ambience. Yeah. So maybe you're doing a little of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a restaurant in Las Vegas, in fact, that has an olive tree right in the middle of it, a live awesome. olive tree. And so that was really the, yeah. the entry into, hey, we don't have to have an olive tree in every restaurant, but we can make that restaurant unique to the marketplace. So that's what you know we try to do. We try to incorporate what might be special about a given area um, that we're opening that restaurant, but also bring some really cool, <clears throat> excuse me, Greek elements to it. And it's so far it's been uh, well received and we get a lot of comments on it. So we'll continue to do that. You mentioned music, uh, you know, we don't, we blast, uh, you know, contemporary uh, Greek music into our restaurant. So it also enhances, you know, that feel as well. Uh, very upbeat, uh, so it's uh, it, it continues to keep our vibe, but it's done in a very authentic way. 
Yeah. When you run a franchise, you want things, the quality is certainly coming through, but then the systems have to be somewhat simplistic and not complex so they can easily be duplicated. And Greek cuisine is noted for its sauces and its spices and, and the detail is certainly there. So how do you, how do you marry those things, getting the quality, getting the detail yet quick service with the, you know, the nuances of what really makes Greek and Mediterranean cuisine what it is. Get everything you need for your operation with Smithfield Culinary. Their extensive portfolio lets you serve up a wide variety of proteins to keep your patrons happy. Choose from Smokin' Fast, which lets you add barbecue to your menu without adding a pit master to your payroll. Or browse their margarita offerings, encompassing everything you need for pizza toppings, plus a variety of specialty Italian meats like capicola, prosciutto, and salami. Finally, serve what you love with Smithfield, which includes everything from bacon to hot dogs to deli meats and so much more. For the products and solutions to keep your operation running strong, visit smithfieldculinary.com. I call this the business of a thousand details, and you've got more important things to worry about than calculating and paying your monthly sales tax on time. Well, that's where Davo comes in. Davo puts sales tax on autopilot for restaurants. Davo uses sales tax data from your point of sale system to set aside the exact amount of sales tax you collect every single day and then files it and pays it when it's due on time for your restaurant every month. Davo takes just five minutes to set up and once it's up and running, you never have to worry about paying sales tax again. Davo costs $49.99 per POS connection per month, and your restaurant can try Davo for the first 30 days free. Davo was created by a successful restaurant chef and owner who knows what's important for your operation. Time is money, and you've got more important things to focus on, like pleasing your guests. You can't put a price on peace of mind. Why not try Davo for the first 30 days at DavoSalesTax.com? Yeah, I mean, first, you know, on our side, we have an incredibly experienced team. <clears throat> and what our team, you know, has learned over the years is it all starts with selecting the right people to execute those systems and those menus and those recipes. <clears throat> we could have the, the most well-written recipes and system, but if we don't have the right people um, who are committed and passionate um, about delivering great food and great experience, then it breaks down. So we spend a lot of time making sure, you know, we have the right people. We have an amazing training staff. Obviously our systems uh, over uh, 11 years have been well-developed um, and well-established along with our recipes. Um, so now it's just plug and play the right people, training them up. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a fantastic team that, that we've assembled that's able to uh, really get in, train uh, and coach up our operators, their managers, their frontline um, employees, and you know across the board, we're having tremendous um, consistency of delivering the experience we want, and that's really a, it's a testament to our our franchise operators um, who have the passion and want to deliver that. You know, as you know, this business there's a lot of monotony in it, right? Doing the same thing over and over and over again, um, and so we have to continuously support and emphasize the. This is the result of doing it over and over and over and over again. Don't change a thing. Um, just follow it and, and you'll have success. And, you know, our operators believe it and they see it and they execute it. And it's and it's showing if you look at our our, you know, our uh, aggregated ratings from multiple places across the board, you know, they're four, four and a half uh, stars. So it's a very consistent execution um, as we get the feedback from those guests around the country. Now, your company is known for retaining and celebrating staff. I want to talk about that because that's, a, that's something really near and dear to my heart. When I ran restaurants, you know, I built what I call the dream team and recognition rewards were very important. Everyone works for a paycheck, but people really work for something more. They, they want to feel like they fit into a place. They want to feel like there's opportunity to move ahead. They want to have that camaraderie with the team. They want to feel the team spirit and they want to feel that even if it's monotonous, it can still be fun. This is a business of fun. It's a business of passion. Tell us about the philosophies and perhaps the onboarding and training that gets your people there. And then once we cover that, I want to talk a little bit about solutions to the labor crisis, because that's something every restaurant is dealing with. But let's, let's pretend that doesn't exist for now. Let's talk about how your company operates and how it trains and onboards. And you know the retention piece is so important because this is a high turnover business, but let's talk about celebrating staff. But how do you get there, Bob? 
Yeah, great question. And it's something obviously, you know, everyone in the restaurant business and most retail businesses are talking about, you know, today it all starts, you know, for us um, culturally, you know, with United Franchise Group and, you know, um, the people who work for our company, um, we require to have passion. Right. If we're interviewing people and passion doesn't come across and and, and inspiration that people want to, to grow, um, that person usually doesn't, um, you know, make it onto our team. So for us, it always starts with the passion, the desire to do something special um, and then comes the skill set. Right. You need the skill set. But I'd much rather have someone passionate who has a desire to grow. Um, than someone who has no passion, no desire with high skill set. So culturally, our organization celebrates that. Um, and those are the people that that we bring in. Now, step that forward when we understand, hey, who's a good fit for us culturally? It's now being able to recruit cultural fits that have the technical skill set to be successful in the position. So um, we have a, a pretty uh, extensive interview process <clears throat> to make sure that you know, people who are not a fit don't don't make it through. And you know, I have a gentleman we we kid around. He he had twenty interviews. Okay, uh, that's not yeah. that's not common. It just happened no, uh, no. during. Uh, yeah. uh, we're ready. yeah, it's a different story. But most people will talk to um, a good eight people, whether they are formal or informal. I like to do informal stuff. Have team members call people, and my question is: Is this a fit for the team? Not about does they have the skill set? Of course, we want to. They does it, they understand what the role is, and and but do they fit the team? And that's what we've had success is to make sure we have people who fit each other. They're there to support each other. Uh, whatever it takes. Attitude, as you know, in this business, it's it's up and down, up and down. There's no right, right. So people have to be able to be flexible, adjust to that. Um, it's right now or you lose, you know. And so those are the kind of people that we bring in and then we train them up. You know, we train them up on soft skills. Um, we expect them to bring the hard skills and the soft skills are bringing that hospitality um, to now transfer to our franchisees, right? So now our franchise operators, we look for the same kind of elements, right? One, are they passionate about the business? So someone who comes to me and says, I just want to make money, maybe not the best no, fit. Someone no. who comes to me and says, yes. You know, I have a passion for food. I have a passion to give back to the community and I like to make money. That's my, you know, that's a perfect um, person. And so that's what we look for when we interview them. I'm not even asking what's your restaurant experience. I want to know, have you grown? Have you hired, trained, grown teams? Do you lead teams? Uh, what's your experience in that? Because I can teach you how to cut lettuce, how to cut meat, how to grill the meat and how to put a smile on your face and serve the food. So for us, it's looking at, really all those key soft skills, assuming that they have most of, yep. you know, the hard um, technical skills. And then we sell um, a vision to that person. That's part of it, right? If, you know, Roger, when you sit in and you're in an interview, you're looking at a person across from you and we've all done it. You'd say, either you see yourself working for this person or you don't. And we have to make sure that, you know, we're a great uh, employer or manager or leader and that we're showing that in individual a path, right? What's the path to success? No one starts in a restaurant wanting to be a cashier the rest of their life, work on a, on a cook grill the rest of their life, or a manager. They usually have aspirations to get up to the next level. McDonald's built a great company on that concept of just training people through their system. And, and that's the approach we take is always showing what, what's your next step, what's your pathway. Now, there are people who are just content with those positions and that's great we're happy to have those people as well but most people want to see a path they want to be part of something exciting and then the last thing specifically for this brand um it is a really nice place to work if you're in the restaurant business we have great uh <clears throat> great management great leadership uh, a lot of respect a lot of hard work and then our our customer base is is amazing you know that people who want to eat great food and they want to you know, take care of themselves. And, and so it just makes for a nice environment, you know, for a, uh, for a restaurant employee. So it starts at the top, basically it's cultural all the way down and we have to support it. Whether you're the president of the organization, you're one of our uh, operations, marketing people, all the way to transferring that to our franchise operators. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's so important for our audience to hear 
because now it's more important than ever to have that approach with management. And like you said, lead by example and, and top down is so important. But in the past, you know, there are managers that delegate and there are managers that empower. And those are two very different things. And in my mind, you know, anybody can tell somebody what to do and delegate a job, but it's a rare manager that can give someone responsibility, show them how to do something, nurture, develop, and empower them, and then recognize and reward that achievement. Those are two completely different things. And it sounds like that's the philosophy of your company. Absolutely. And, and just to take that step further, I mean, we have a, a gentleman we just brought on, he's in training. So I'm talking to my you know, my leader in operations, like, you know, let's make sure we touch base with them. Let's make sure training's going well, see if there's anything we need. We have another person we're onboarding on Friday. I'm going to make a call to him, just welcome him um, to the team. It's those little things, you know, talk about hospitality, just those little things of just acknowledging someone and how important they are going to be or are um, to us to achieve our objectives, our goals, uh, to grow the brand is incredible. It's incredibly important. And I, if I get feedback on anything from people who've been on my team throughout the year, uh, through the years, it's they appreciate them being acknowledged and recognized. And I just find that is so simple. And the more we do yes. it, the more success we have. Absolutely. Let's talk about some of the challenges of business right now, specifically the labor crisis. How has that affected the company and how are you dealing with it? What are some of your best practices? Obviously, costs are higher than ever. We have to pay more for labor now to compete with other industries that have traditionally paid more. A lot of exodus from this business, people going to other industries. But again, the culture of the business, again, is foundational. How you treat your people is foundational. And you know the grass is not always greener if you're doing all the right things here. And a lot of people find that out. But how are you dealing with the challenges? challenge. Yeah, I think um, emphasizing what we just spoke about, right? F finding great people in the restaurant business to work for you is nothing new. It's pre dates pre COVID. Yes, it does. There were more bodies to bring into your restaurant, but really assembling a team that can deliver the experience you want was always needed a lot of work. And it started with all those foundational things. So to me, uh, any restaurant organization, if they don't have that foundation, they need to establish that because they're going to lose out to the companies who are, and it's going to be much more difficult. Today's environment is just fewer people, right? And so it's more important that you can emphasize those differences. We're going to treat you with respect. Um, you're going to be part of uh, you know, the family and the team. You're going to work in a very nice environment. We're going to give you flexible uh, schedule and hours and work with you. All those things that great employers have done for uh, a while. Um, to recruit people, we just want to emphasize those things. Um, you know, interestingly enough, everyone's paying high wages and most people are not making that decision just based on the wage, um, unless you're far off. So you have to be competitive where the wage is in those markets. It's different in Houston, Texas than it is in Charleston, South Carolina or in Chicago, Illinois. And so our operators um, and our team need to to really adjust to that, to be competitive. But it still comes back to emphasizing those core things and showing people um, a pathway. Um, and then, then getting after it and do everything you say you're going to do to keep them um, engaged and keep them hired. So for us, it used to be Roger, when we went into a new market or opened a new store, we had a grand opening marketing launch plan for either that location and um, <clears throat> that market. Today, we have two marketing launches. We have one aimed at um, attracting employees <clears throat> prior to the launch to attract the consumer. Um, so that has shifted um, for us in, in some cases, uh, you know, we've, um, you know, we've get teams out on the street, just going out approaching we whatever it takes to do to get someone interested to come into an interview and hire them on the spot is what our team do. We have a, I would say maybe 15 different tactics that are deployed, uh, not all at the same time, not even all, but, but they're tactics and tools that our operators can use um, to help them get in front of those people. And then it comes back to, again, those talking about those fundamental things. That person across from you needs to say, I believe in that person and I want to work for that person. And that's ultimately what we try to coach our operators up to. Have you had challenges with supply chain shortages on the um, items that you're bringing into the stores? And besides that, have you seen dramatic price increases as well? And how have your company dealt with that? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the the first one. I mean, the price increases is affecting everyone, whether it's shortage in product, um, um, issues with the manufacturing, um, labor in manufacturing, labor in shipping. You know, it's all those <clears throat> things. So sometimes a product not making it to, you know, our location is not because there's a shortage, but all those all those elements in that is creating um, price increases. And so, um, you know, we've seen things go up as high as 30%. Uh, and, you know, typically it's 10, 15%, a couple of different times. I expect we're gonna see another price increase here on items, uh, probably here in the, in the early summer is what we're hearing. So our team has um, gone out and we re-engaged our vendors. We're renegotiating um, contracts to put our um, operators in a better position um, you know, we're looking at things like margin schedule with our broadliner to, um, you know, a fixed price per case, uh, just to mitigate some of that risk that we have mm -hmm. um, moving forward. So we've been able to really curtail it for a uh, for a small brand. We've been able to partner with, um, you know, uh, some some uh, group pur purchasing organizations and really position ourselves uh, to do the best thing possible. So we are seeing it. Um, unfortunately, we can't pass all of that price increase on Correct. to our consumers. But as you know, you're hearing, and it's true with our brand, we are passing some of that cost on. So our conversations is, although we're passing that cost, we need to now create more value. One of the things we won't do that you're seeing a lot of brands doing is um, is making portion size smaller. Um, and so we're we're sticking with the same quality ingredients, uh, the same food philosophy, uh, the same portion size, the same big plates. Um, and, you know, for us, um, our guests get it and they're willing to pay a little bit more to have, you know, that great taste in food that's fresh. And it's, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a great ingredient. So it's a push and pull. You made an excellent point about doing everything you can to minimize margin decreases and trying to maintain those margins for your stores. Like whether you have one store or 200 stores, it's so important. The independent operator really doesn't have the economies of scale that you have. But again, it's like you have to know your weekly finances. You got to know what your food cost is. You got to know what your labor cost is. You got to dial in all your systems just to be able to, like I said, maintain those margins. You know, communication is super important right now as well. And first it was the COVID thing. Okay. Once the dust settled and, and customers started coming back into restaurants, whether, you know, there were shutdowns temporarily or whether everyone went to curbside pickup and delivery and that sort of model, it's like we had to communicate communicate the safety practices to the consumer, what we were doing to maintain, you know, the health and safety of our employees and the health and safety of our guests and all that sort of thing. Now it's about communicating about the challenges that we're having and telling customers we're doing everything we can to hold our pricing where it is. And these are the challenges we're up against yet. We, we really appreciate your business. Thank you for supporting us. How does your company communicate these things we're talking about to the end guest? Um, you know, we do it at the at the front lines and manager level of of the restaurant. And, you know, as as you've mentioned, and I just stated earlier that communication with the guests, <clears throat> whether it's about your product or how you're servicing them or what they can expect is what creates that value, you know, right. to the value guests. proposition. So, mm -hmm. so our you know, our whole focus is on that value piece. So that includes all those things that we mentioned. So, so, you know, we'll communicate obviously verbally with our guests. We'll communicate through um, having messaging, you know, in our restaurant. Um, we'll communicate through our database uh, about different issues. Um, and so we continue to, to do that. And it really happens on, on the front line. So again, it comes down, it comes through the operators um, to the guest, but communicating with the guests is nothing new. Um, for our operators and front line. So it's it's a rather effortless transition to get the information uh, and then, you know, putting up messaging um, in the restaurant. You mentioned earlier, it's very important for, you know, your different stores to be active in the communities that they serve. What are some of the things or the directives that, uh, that you see happening and that you perhaps pass on to your stores that you're doing locally? Yeah, I, I love that question. You know, I tell... I tell people when I first got into this business, part of my career, I went and operated restaurants and I did it solely for financial reasons. I was one of those, one of those. So was I. 
And what I recognized was into about, you know, month nine to month 12, that the, I was much more rewarding giving back to my team, my customers and the community and hearing those comments of, I love your food. I love your team. You're the best person I ever worked for. Um, those kind of things were much more rewarding than any dollar that I made. Mm-hmm. Now, I did find though, the more I got those comments, the more dollars I made. Right. So oh, yeah, focus, direct connection there. So the, so the focus got shifted on, on that. And so we have, uh, the way we do it at, at the Great Creek is everyone shows up usually with their own area that they're passionate about to want to give back, whether it's to their employees um, and the community. Some people in the community, it might be a church, it might be a school band, it might be um, uh, some of the great organizations that are supporting breast cancer or leukemia. It usually it usually reverts back to what is that life experience of that individual and we support that. And so, you know, it's flexible in the way, but we want that operator to get involved with, you know, something that they're passionate about and then community items like schools and churches and those those types of organization where you're really supporting the church. There's usually a food bank, you know, for, mm-hmm. for us to go back to the community um, in that area. So we'll have a host of things um, obviously, you know, I'd like people to choose, you know, usually two, maybe three. So they really can put a good effort, but it usually starts with that one initiative that drives that individual's experience. Um, and then it's off to um, sometimes you're approached, you know, when you're in a restaurant, if you operated restaurants, you're approached by people in the community um, on a daily basis on wanting help or assistance and, you know, picking and choosing what might have the most impact to that community um, would be important. We have veterans and they want to support, you know, veteran organizations. There's so many different things yeah. and so many ways, you know, if people want to give back, I tell them there's no better place to do it than in the restaurant business. Doing good by doing good. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. That's great. Let's talk about necessary technology. You know, the pandemic has really shifted that in a lot of operations that really didn't have online ordering before and third-party delivery and all these, all these new technologies have emerged. What's really important for your stores? What has really worked, whether it's uh, pre-pandemic or during the pandemic or even right now? What, what, I mean, it's shifted the whole way we do business. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're really focused on technology right now that makes us more, more efficient, right? More efficient really on the backside of our business. You know, our, our philosophy is, you know, high tech, but high touch, right? We don't want to give up. <clears throat> you know, we go back, we, you know, with kiosks in our restaurant and those kind of things. And you yeah. know, we're really not there from mm-hmm. a mindset. People can easily order online. So we're making those friction points easier for our guests. Like, how is it easier for them to use us? So if Roger is in his car, he wants to hop on his mobile, order something from the Great Greek on the way home from work, we want to make that really simple and easy. So those are really the, the primary technologies. Secondary, you know, I would say are things that make us more efficient, integrate um, us better into our systems to make more efficient operator uh, operations for um, our operators. So customer touch points first, and then really efficiency uh, and operations uh, second. And then, you know, everything else after that is, um, you know, things that on a case by case basis, we look, but the ultimate goal is how do we make um, it easier to either do business for us, or easier to work and get the information we need, the insights we need to make better decisions. Perfect. Let's talk a little bit about loyalty and rewards. Um, The way you operate your business clearly leads to repeat business, but then the icing on the cake is really the rewards program that definitely gives them incentive to come back in. What has worked for you? And tell us about that program. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is something we're debating right now, actually, and looking at. I think we're at, at at the answer of it. But you know, loyalty rewards, as you know, is highly based on po- a point system. Mm-hmm. Right? I think American Airlines might have really years and years ago kind of started that. You know, gather points, you get a free ticket. <clears throat> Starbucks has an amazing um, platform too, but people use Starbucks every day gathering those points for us when we went out and talked to you know our guests especially in the restaurants that have been with us for a while um you know we saw that they just want to get recognized for their visits so we're shifting really to a visit-based 
uh, platform where we can uh, introduce to them different items, different uh, incentives based on uh, their visits. And so, you know, for us, uh, we're in the process of beta testing and really starting to roll out a, a more robust loyalty program based on visits, connecting, engagement, uh, delivering our message of live your life deliciously. Let's talk about catering. Now, that's another, you know, I'm a big believer in multiple profit centers and restaurants and catering clearly is, you know, another way of, you know, going off site and delivering the same quality. But it's also a marketing tool, introduces people to the restaurant, brings people back to the restaurant once they've experienced, you know, the cuisine and the hospitality delivered by the people. What is it to start a catering operation simply and how can you create or I should say, recreate all of your recipes in volume so that you can take it to a large event and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's one of the opportunities, Roger, that we see, you know, as a brand that we really haven't scratched the surface um, of the opportunities that catering brings to, you know, our, our operators and, and each individual unit. So um, at the beginning of this year, uh, we started uh, reworking our catering program to enhance it. Uh, we just completed that at the end of, of this first quarter. Going into the third quarter, we'll be rolling out um, into our restaurant some um, POP, some messaging um, to really emphasize our ability to cater. Um, the benefits of it are everything that you mentioned. First of all, you leverage you know, you leverage your facilities, you leverage your labor to a great um, extent. You might have a five person catering event. You might have a 500 person catering event. And, you know, the more you grow that business, the more impact it has on your restaurant financially, but also the ancillary benefits are exactly what you mentioned. The opportunity to introduce people to our food and our brand who have not had it before or they've had it and it's been a while since uh, they've come into the restaurant or it gets them re-engaged. So it's definitely an area that, that we're focused on. We're already starting to have um, some great success. We're really excited about you know, our revamped program. Um, our food travels incredibly well. Um, I mentioned earlier, it's cross-cultural. What I didn't mention is that if you are a vegetarian, a flexitarian, a pescatarian, any of those tarians, or you're a meat eater like I am, okay, we accommodate all those dietary requirements. Um, so it makes it really easy, especially for, for employers today when they bring food and they really need to be cognizant of, you know, who their work you know, their workplace and who they're serving food to. Um, we have beautiful, clean looking food that tastes great. And whether you're a vegetarian or want meat, we can accommodate that. So um, it really presents well for all occasions. And that's a huge advantage um, for the brand. So we'll continue to push that out going into the fourth quarter, uh, really at the end of the third quarter here, we'll really start ramping up the messaging uh, to amplify uh, the awareness of, uh, of our catering program which is very exciting for our operators and, and especially for our team. Let's talk about your growth plans. Now there's currently around 20 stores operating and you're opening 20 more quickly. What's the timeline for that? And is it a regional expansion? Do you see national expansion in the future? Tell us about that. Yeah, it all starts with what I shared with you earlier. You know, the brand vision really is to be the, the, the world's leading fat, fine, fast, casual Mediterranean restaurant. So because of um, being part of United Franchise Group, we have resources all over the U.S., but we also have them all over the world. So our growth trajectory right now is actually worldwide. We have a, a group in Canada that uh, we just brought on, uh, and they'll be developing in, in Ontario, and we're already having some good success there. Um, we're also looking to do deals in um, in Europe. and Amazing. In, uh, and in Australia, and we have dedicated teams in those markets already, That's again, funny. emphasizing the strength of, you know, our great organization, UFG. But what's most exciting right now is what's happening domestically. We have 21 restaurants currently operating in the United States from, you know, we're in <clears throat> Florida, we're here in Texas, we're in Michigan, um, you know, we're spread out mm -hmm. um, all over the U.S. We're going to be opening uh, yeah, 20 to 25 restaurants this year is where it will come in from California to New Jersey uh, and everywhere in between. So we have the team, we have the resources and fortunate for us um, and the ability to do that at a very high level 
um, we'll, 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 we'll almost triple in size this year in a sales component because we continue to keep growing our sales year over year as well. So um, it's very exciting and, and we're growing our team and we're able to grow throughout the, uh, the United States and the world. And again, it starts with having great franchise operators and, and we have some excellent people who are really driving that growth for us. Well, this has been a tremendous episode. We've learned a lot. We talked about best practices. We talked about how you develop a team and how you get the most out of your people. And I really love the fact that it really wasn't about experience. It's really about personality, approach, and a true desire to serve the customer. And that word hospitality really came through in this episode. You're really inspiring guy, Bob. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, as well. Well, this could be a new opportunity for those operators out there. I love the way this company is run and it's clearly a professional organization. So I think we all learned a lot. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We can't wait to see you in the next episode. Stay well, everyone. Thanks, Bob, for sharing your insights into brand building and creating that image and aura and ambiance that really draw people in and take them away from their day to day and really give them a new experience that uh, only leads to positive word of mouth and repeat business and positive online reviews. You've got it uh, all wrapped up at Great Greek Mediterranean Grill. I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thanks also to the sponsors of this week's episode, Pop Menu, Smithfield Culinary, Devo, and Serve, the restaurant training app found at srvnow.com. Don't miss the next episode. We'll see you then. People go to restaurants for lots of reasons, for fun, celebration, for family, for lifestyle. What the customer doesn't know is the thousands of details it takes to run a great restaurant. This is a high-risk, high-fail business. It's hard to find great staff. Costs are rising and profits are disappearing. It's a treacherous road and smart operators need a professional guide. I'm Roger. I've started many highly successful, high-profit restaurants that I've now sold for millions of dollars. I'm passionate about helping other owners and managers not just succeed, but knock it out of the park. I created a game-changing system, and it's filled with everything I've learned in over 20 years running super profitable, super fun restaurants. Everything from creating high-profit menu items and cost controls, to staff training where your teams serve and sell, to marketing hooks, money-maximizing tips, and efficiencies across your operation. What does this mean to you? More money to invest in your restaurant to hire a management team, time freedom, and peace of mind. You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to dominate your competition and create a lasting legacy. Join the Academy, and I'll show you how it's done. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.